The internet is full of mysterious and horrible things, but they're not always in the public eye. We have a series on the channel known as the Rabbit Hole and also Iceberg Series. In these series, we go down deep within the depths of a certain topic and we find what we can. And a lot of the things that we find are disturbing. Some of them we just can't talk about, like the Angry Birds geopolitical incident, not to mention the Russian man that created a homunculi and posted the whole thing on YouTube. The internet iceberg runs incredibly deep, and today's episode is probably the most bizarre and disturbing yet. Strap in. If you want to see more content like this, press the like button. And yes, I do realize that I do not have a mustache on my face. I understand. I have a mustache the other 364 days of the year. I shaved it. I'm growing it back. Full facial hair. In solidarity with men, basically. Mental health, cancer, etc. 112 dirt bags. Let's have a little bit of a thought exercise here. Think of the average internet troll. What exactly comes to mind? A Discord user? A Twitter bot? Are they a man? Are they a woman? How old are they? Childs. Usually little children. A lot of them are. Blippi's audience. But we'll get to Blippi. Yeah. Today we're talking about 112 Dirtbag. An infamous internet troll known as Alden Olson, a 68-year-old man who was infamous for trolling the family of Mara Murray after her disappearance in 2004. Mara Murray was 21 years old when she vanished and she's been missing for nearly 20 years now. This is her, uh, her information here. Currently a cold case, etc. You know, terrible, tragic story. She vanished on February 9th, 2004 after crashing her car into a snowbank along Route 112 in Woodsville, New Hampshire. The crash was even observed by a stranger who was looking through their window at the time and uh, they saw Mara's car, a black second gen Saturn S series, apparently identical to this beastly whip, uh, crash into a snowbank, you know, off 112 in Woodsville, New Hampshire. This stranger resident to the area called the Grafton County Sheriff's Department to report the accident. Uh, and by the way, the first example of witness testimony being unreliable starts here. Apparently on the call with the Sheriff's Department, the woman who saw the accident take place said she saw a man smoking a cigarette inside the car. Although later she said she had not seen a man or a person smoking a cigarette. She had seen a red light glowing in the car. A school bus driver stopped at the scene and saw a young woman walking around outside the vehicle, presumably Mora. This man offered help to Mora, who was not bleeding or visibly injured. She was just cold and shivering. She refused help and then said that she had AAA and asked him to not call the police, although the woman inside the house had already called the police. Interestingly enough, AAA reports having never received a call from Mora. And despite her request to not call the sheriff, the bus driver, who happened to live quite close to the area, went home and called the police at 7.43 p.m even though they'd already been called by the woman looking out the window, but they arrived on the scene according to the police report at 7.46 p.m. that day. But another witness in the report claims to have seen a police SUV parked uh, bumper to bumper with uh, Mora's car at 7.37 p.m. So way before, like the, the timelines don't match up at all. So maybe her clock was wrong, maybe the police reports were a few minutes off. Who knows, dude? I don't, I'm just, a, I'm just the internet guy. Another bizarre thing is her recounting of the scene. She said that there was no one inside or outside any of the vehicles. So most of the evidence we have is what the police report claims. In the course of the accident, her airbags deployed and there were red stains found inside and outside of her vehicle. The source of the red stains would be discovered as a box of Franzia box wine that was in the rear seat. They would also find an empty beer bottle in the car as well, potentially driving under the influence. Not exactly sure. You're not allowed to have open containers in a vehicle that's moving, whatever, okay. That could be potentially a reason why she asked for the police not to be called, but that's just logic, right? It's not a, a, an allegation or anything meant to be disrespectful. There was also an apparent sighting of Mora that would happen between 8 and 9.30 p.m. that night when a contractor driving on the same road, 112, um, about four or five miles further in the direction she was traveling, she was seen by this contractor well after her vehicle had crashed. <laughs> And this sighting wouldn't be discovered and added into the investigation until three months later when the contractor would kind of finally put two and two and then review his work records and kind of, you know, he realized what was going on. It makes sense. Law enforcement even tried using search dogs to search for her by using her gloves that were in her car, and they only went 100 yards from where her vehicle had been. Now, police believe this was a sign or evidence that she had gotten to another car, uh, you know, 
100 yards away from her own and then left the area. Although the sighting of her four to five miles down the road makes less sense if this is the case. So we're really just speculating here. And until this day, like I mentioned earlier, it's a cold case. She still has not been found two decades of searching. And it's important to note as well that her father suspects that her disappearance was not a choice of her own, that she was taken or kidnapped or something like that and called whoever did it a dirtbag. Hence the name, Dirtbag 112. So now I'll key you in on how this relates to our friend, Dirtbag 112. And by friend, I mean piece of shit, old bastard, asshole guy. On the seventh anniversary of Mara Murray's disappearance, a video titled Happy Anniversary was posted to a now deleted YouTube channel called 112 Dirtbag, supposedly named after Route 112, where Mara disappeared and taking the moniker Dirtbag from what Mara's father had called the perpetrator of her disappearance. In the video, which has been re-uploaded, you can see this man, Olsen, laughing very creepily at the camera. <laughs> So, as you can probably imagine, this crazy old f***er whose name is closely related to a cold case of a missing woman who is just laughing at this camera, he's gonna involve himself in the investigation. This is not that funny. I don't know why he's f***ing laughing like that. Channels around, it got deleted. This is the only surviving video, but there were apparently other videos, which we do not have, in which he taunted Mara's family. Dude's a f***ing troll, an asshole troll. He also apparently suggested in these videos that he had information about Mara's disappearance, uh, but that obviously, because the videos no longer exist, cannot be substantiated at this time. Police would begin to investigate this old bastard, but despite the video, they found no evidence that linked him to her disappearance. Was he just a troll? Was there a deeper connection there? I have no idea. Regardless, Mara has not been found still, you know, and why would you celebrate this seven years after on the anniversary? It just seems strange. Is he just a fucking weird psychopath addicted to true crime? Who knows what's going on here? After trolling Mara Murray's family, he moved on to other targets though. He even made threats towards the family of a fellow named James Renner, who wrote a book called True Crime Addict. James covered Mara's disappearance in his book. This was in 2012, by the way. Once again, very important to note that a lot of this could not be substantiated. These claims are bold. Uh, I don't really see a reason why James would lie beyond maybe drumming up some hype for his book not sure. In a post from July 2015, James talks about Alden Olson uploading a video of James Renner's son in 2012, and also how Alden sent a Photoshop picture of James next to Kenny from South Park, the character who dies in every episode, basically. James also claims that the Northwestern District Attorney Stephen Gagney, the fuck Gainey, I'm not sure what his name is, talked to him at length about Alden Olson and then said that they just couldn't do anything about him because he's just trolling. He's like just being a fucking weird freak online. He's just making strange videos. But this video, like you can imagine, was taken down because it was about a man's child. That's against terms of service, even in 2012, you two. Apparently, Alden was investigated and not seen as a credible threat, although James claims that he was, and he found that in 2007, he was arrested for threatening to murder his own brother and sister. Now, search for this, couldn't find it myself, couldn't verify it, so take it with what you will. James is an interesting fellow, writes a good book. We did verify that Stephen Gagney was in fact the district attorney though. James had another very bizarre post in 2015, September of that year, in which he suggested that Alden Olson could have been the inspiration behind a murder that happened on a live TV broadcast. Apparently a comment on the original happy anniversary video before it was deleted was a comment of a fellow named Vester Lee Flanagan. Now I personally remember this and was sort of scared because the dude after he murdered two people, uh, 24 year old Allison Parker and 27 year old Adam Ward on live TV, um, he drove up 81 and 66 in Virginia where I'm from and where I was working at the time. Like my place of work was along 81 and the police and stuff like went by and we heard it. It was wild. It was, it was pretty, I mean, I, you know, I'm not involved in any way. Quite frankly, I probably should just cut all of this out, but you know, Vester Lee Flanagan, piece of shit related to this guy, I thought it'd be interesting to say. It's f***ed up. It's horrible. So while Alden didn't commit these murders, obviously it has nothing to do with him necessarily, but the top comment is from a guy who is an actual murderer, which is not a great look for anyone involved. So why is this whole thing really notable? There's a lot of cold cases, like we've talked about Missing 411 before. Uh, one of the reasons that this whole thing is remembered by so many people is because it's sort of the first crime mystery of the social media age. 
and it's a notable incident. Mora disappeared in February 2004, and Facebook came about in February of 2004. There was no YouTube or Twitter at the time, so it was mainly talked about on a website called Web Sleuths as early as 2005. People were trying to investigate this. Um, so it was like the first time really ever that social media played a part in trying to solve a crime, which unfortunately still is unsolved to this very day. There's Facebook pages, MySpace pages that are made dedicated to finding her, but alas, nothing. Blippi's Harlem Shake. Now this is one story that I'm a little bit nervous to talk about because people have gotten strikes for talking about this or copyright strikes, whatever, because it involves a loved childhood hero of many people. You know Blippi, that little fella? Well, Blippi, he's not exactly the Mr. Rogers of modern media as many would claim he is. No one is claiming that, by the way. No one is claiming, he's portraying himself as a really nice, cute, funny guy. So much to learn about, it'll make you wanna shout, Blippi! Oh, hey, it's me, Blippi! With millions upon kajillions of people flocking to his fucking child channel. I don't even know, man. How do you have, uh, Blippi learns about jungle animals for kids, educational video for toddlers. How about uh, on the autoplay up next, you show the Blippi Harlem shake. How about you show that to them kids? Get them in, get them young, dude. Break them in young, expose them to the world. Just kidding, maintain innocence for as long as you possibly can. The world is a terrible place and sheltering your kids, controlling what they're exposed to, I believe has a very important uh, place in, in, in logic and rationality of being a human being in the modern day. Did he make the light brown? Did they make the light brown? I told him to do that edit specifically, so nobody gets credit for that except for me. All right. In fact, from now on, I edit all the videos. I do all of it. Give me credit in that shit. This dude gets a lot of views, like an absurd amount of views. You've probably seen him, and if you haven't, your nephew definitely has. Your little brother, your little sister, whatever. This dude is a child fucking magnet. I don't understand it at all. Here's him riding an elephant ride. This guy's for sure acoustic or something. I just can't remember a time in which I would have ever thought that that's entertaining. I remember very deep into my childhood. I thought the, I'm a map, I'm a map. I thought Dora was for mouth breathing troglodytes when I was a child, like a four year old kid. I would see my sister going, oh, yeah. <laughs> my sister's name is Mackenzie and she looks like Dee Dee from Rugrats, just like her. She was like, oh, and I was like, dude, what's wrong with you? Let's watch the Outdoor Channel. Let's watch Jim Shockey. Also, another really strange thing about Blippi is that he's sort of like Guy Fawkes in that he's evolved to a larger thing than just one guy. One guy isn't Blippi. People play Blippi. It's a lineage of entertainers that play Blippi. So there's a lot of lore and canon in the Blippi universe, which I'm really not that interested in learning. To be completely honest with you all, I want to know more about this Harlem Shake video, though. Do you remember the Harlem Shake? Because that shit was hot. That was that was a hot commodity for a while. By the way, Filthy Frank started that. How crazy is that? Kind of a weird little thing, Vidal. I mean, it's a weird little thing for you. In modern times, Blippi is synonymous with kid-friendly, educational-centered content, and he's amassed nearly 19 million followers on YouTube from his angelic 777 videos. Big merchandising opportunities. He's got toys. This guy is an absolute legend amongst mouth-breathing troglodytes, aka children. Look at all these Blippi toys, dude. He's got to be a billionaire, by the way. Let's see. Blippi net worth. Holy shit. That is insane. He's going to send a hitman and kill me, probably. He's got so much money. I didn't realize that. Oh my god. But um, you know, and the content, by the way, is completely fine. It's just children's content. It's boring for me, a 27-year-old man that lacks a mustache. But for a baby, you know, that shit is hot. That's awesome. That is like, I can't peel my eyes away. I'm like a moth to a flame. Behind all that, you may be surprised to learn that his charming smile, his high-pitched squealing voice, and behind that massive child toy empire that this man has built, is a dark and troubling past. One that the original Blippi, Stephen John, has worked very hard to bury and ensure that it will never see the light of day. Which, 
I understand that. And this isn't meant to, you know, like this guy, just because he had a really weird past doesn't mean he shouldn't be making children's content. Just kidding. Wait till you hear about this. What if I told you that before Stephen John was the beloved Blippy, he was known as Steezy Grossman. Now this is an interesting name because it's it's weird. It's very bad. It's a terrible name. So is Blippy, but this is even worse. Steezy Grossman to me is the next big up and coming kick streamer. That's who that is to me in my head. That's like a massive piece of shit freakazoid uh, with a huge audience of current day kick viewers. Content that's definitely adult oriented, etc. Uh, you know, and that's what it was. It, it actually was adult oriented content, a, a huge drastic difference from his uh, Blippi's content now. Steven's content now, I guess. There's even a masterpiece of a video called Turd Boy, in which Steven plays the titular role of the Turd Boy. It's about getting pregnant from the bum bum copulation, butt copulation, uh, and then having a poop baby be born, and it struggles to fit in in life, and it is absolutely disgusting, okay? And it's a fake trailer from a movie in which Turd Boy finds love. Absolutely disgusting, horrible, absolute trash. I hate it. It's gross. There's just shit and stuff in it. I don't think I would ever find that funny, to be honest. Um, but maybe a mouth-breathing troglodyte might. In fact, in case you're wondering, this shit was critically acclaimed at the 2012 Machinima Film Festival. Also, the Fable Shit Movie Film Festival. This thing is like, recognized. It's a legend in the in the film sphere, in the poop-centric poop film sphere. And this website that holds this video no longer exists on the clear web, as you can imagine. It's on archive.org. You can't really get rid of it. It's never truly gone. And it's important to take note of the turd boy nature of Steven's character. Turds. Poop. Turds. It's a bit of a theme in this whole thing. It's a bit of a theme. Steezy Grossman is the complete and total opposite of Blippi's persona and the new channel. He made videos about excrement on top of Turd Boy, about genitalia, things like that. He had a video titled Pee Troubles, which we couldn't find a, a re-upload of. There was also a, yet again, critically acclaimed by the shit movie film festival uh, movie called Genie, incredible. Then we cannot forget about Underwear Man, which was a man on the street type interview style video by the looks of the thumbnail. The video is not there anymore. Uh, but the dude is like a sketch comedian, like Julian Smith or, or anyone, improv everywhere, etc. He just had a bit of a unique twist back in the day. He loved NSFW themes. This is not a terrible thing. You know, everyone makes funny jokes and stuff. But now he's a, like has become our version of Mr. Rogers, unfortunately, for these little children that are watching him. These like little infants. I think they're babies, like actually babies. I don't know, though. Who watches Blippi? I don't. I tell you that much is for sure. Not since I was 20. So how does this tie into the Harlem Shake? Well, we have Turd Boy. We have Steezy Gross Man. You get the theme. Gross guy, turd, Harlem Shake. In a video that I cannot show on my channel without getting a strike from probably Steezy Gross Man and also YouTube, the man himself, Steezy, aka Blippy, is in a bathroom with his friend. Harlem Shake is playing. And Steezy's sitting on a toilet with his pants around his ankles. And when that drop hits, the scene shifts a little bit. Boom, do the Harlem Shake. And then you have Steezy, and you've got his buddy. Steezy's naked, he's got a helmet on. He's on the toilet dancing. His buddies laying down there upside down on the wall. He's naked, except for goggles and a swimming cap. Those are to protect him from what's coming next. A torrential downpour. I'm talking inclement weather, the likes of which you have never seen. Of feces erupts from Blippi. I mean, and Steezy, whatever his name is. It goes on to the walls, the floor, his f upside down friend, maybe even into his upside down friend. It is disgusting. Blippy is, Steezy's laughing about this all when this is happening, his friend's gagging, uh, and both of them are trying to shake their legs to do the Harlem Shake while they're, it's so disgusting. I cannot even imagine how you're able to remain friends. Hopefully this guy works with Blippy now. Honestly, I hope this guy is like a ride or die long-term bestie. Hopefully this is like his manager or something. That would be so funny. <laughs> they're still like doing business with each other and he's cleaning shit out of his off of his face after all these years. A couple of gentlemen they are. One with a powerful fecal flow. So how does the dancing poop man, the Harlem Shake legend, uh, or turd boy, whatever you want to call him, become a children's channel. I, I'm not saying that it's not possible, and I'm not saying that it's bad, and this guy's, like, ever done any... I mean, just poop, right? It's not, like, weird. I mean, it is weird, but it's not, like, anything horrible. 
You know, it's not illegal. It's just weird. How does he go from that to the children's channel? That's just ah, oh, it's just strange. I get thinking it's funny and maybe you like, you know, you get too deep. He's an entertainer at heart. And he just really wants to be like Jack. Like if Steve-O started a children's channel, it would kind of make sense. Uh, but that's because we know Steve-O at this point. Like he's kind of changed in this new thing. But Blippy, he was a flash in our minds as Steezy Grossman and he is now just Blippy. So it's different, but it's also the same. So I don't really know. I mean, Steve-O's done worse. Like, let's be real, way more disgusting stuff. Steve-O's disgusting, but I love him. And I would let my kid watch his, nah, no, I wouldn't. As you can imagine, Steezy Grossman, it's impossible to find anything on the internet. And honestly, this video will probably get deleted. Here's a drawing of it. Buzzfeed got a hold of this a while back and Stephen John's attorney sent uh, them a cease and desist asserting that they take it down, asserting the copyright over the video and try to remove it. So they created an artist's rendition. This is basically what it is. This is a classic case of the pendulum swinging and it's swinging really, really, really hard. One extreme to another, it perfectly encapsulates the complexity of the human condition in a in a, 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 it's hard to say any other word, a perfect metaphor. You've got Steezy Grossman and you've got Blippi. Yin and Yang, all right? Yin and Yang, God the Devil, Jedi Sith, all right? Whataburger and, uh, what would be another one? H-E-B. I feel like kind of a d bringing this up, but the dude's rich as so who cares? He's not a struggling actor. He's not struggling. He's doing just fine. My video is not going to have any effect on his his massive empire of children's toys, etc. Uh, he does regret this past heavily. Pretty hilarious, honestly. I do feel bad for him, though. Gray Pacoon. So this story is a sad one. It follows a little Humboldt penguin named Gray Pacoon. Little fella got his name from a purple tag on his wing if you can call it that. And like I mentioned, it's a sad story, one that has been immortalized into stone. One that you should know about, or not stone necessarily, but ones and zeros. Grape Coon started off just like any other little penguin fella. Back in 1996, he was born and he lived at the Hamura Zoo in Tokyo. A cute little zoo. Man, the Japanese even do animal cruelty in a kawaii way. This shit looks very attracting all right i want to become a disney adult but for the hamura zoo in tokyo little fun fact about penguins if you didn't know they're monogamous they find a life partner kind of similar to how humans believe that their relationships are naturally which humans are not naturally monogamous but penguins are all right and this little horny bastard named grape coon in the zoo one day met a female penguin named midori he stretched his arms out and made his call, and by God, it was adorable. Midori reciprocated, and they became a couple. And Midori would be Grape Coon's mate for life. That's how penguin love works. They find one, and then that's it. You know, it's pretty adorable. Later on in March of 2006, the Tobu Zoo, located in Miyashiro, Saitama, Japan, would finish their penguin enclosure. And they then needed to fill those enclosures up with penguins. So, Grape Coon and his partner Midori were transferred to the zoo to fill the place. They slowly adjusted to their new home. At first, things were going swimmingly. Penguin, penguin, uh, penguin joke. Uh, you, you know. Grape and Midori were adjusting. They even had their own son together named Hand Pen. It's Han Pen. I don't know. I like to say things wrong so people comment. But disaster struck. The baby was removed from the enclosure and away from its parents. And then that little fucker was sent to the Itawaga Zoo, somewhere else in Japan. And Midori and Great were never able to see their son again. The zoo claimed that the child relocation was to prevent inbreeding, which makes sense, I guess, right? Uh, but Hanpen, the little child, would eventually breed with his foster mother. So, bit of a fucking freak. These penguins are freaks, dude weirdos. After all this happened, people believe that the removal of Handpen from Grape and Midori would damage their relationship, their monogamous relationship. And that is true, it seems, but something that happened later on really sealed the deal and made it far worse. In 2010, Grape Coon got sick and was separated from the other penguins in his enclosure to undergo treatment. This included his partner Midori. So treatment goes on, Grape Coon gets healthy again, and he goes back to his enclosure for everyone to cheer and, 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 and celebrate his return from the, from the grips of death, essentially. Death grips! Ah! No. Unfortunately, Grape Coon learned that his partner for life had moved on and got with a younger penguin named Denka. What a piece of shit she's for the streets! What a... 
And the rest of the flock, seeing this rejection from Grape Coon to Midori, they shunned him from the group as well. Poor little guy. Grape Coon was completely and utterly and entirely alone. Maybe one of the saddest stories that has ever existed. And this isn't even the fucking half of it. Dude pulls a straight up incel move and I mean, what the f But hold on, before we get to the incel shit, there's a little bit more. Midori and Dinka would have a child of their own named Beer, and this time the baby was not uh, removed from the enclosure, but it was kept there, unlike Grape Coon's son, which was never seen again by him. At the same time, Grape Coon was shunned and rejected, living amongst his ex-wife and her, their new son and the other penguins playing and mating. It reminded him constantly of his loneliness for seven long fucking years, until finally, April 2017, when this little motherfucker turned 21 years old, his life would completely change. Grape Coon. The incel stuff started in 2017 when zoos around Japan started collaborating with a new show called Kimono Friends. And uh, it's about, it was a show about anthropomorphic rare animals. Weeberoo shit, weeberibaloo stuff, you know? But it would still bring awareness to animals and give zoos crazy amounts of exposure. People in Japan love, um, anim tentacle, anim, um, arresting idiots and putting them in jail for a long time. As you can imagine, the Tobu Zoo became one of these Kimono Friends zoos, and they directly partnered up with the studio and the team behind Kimono Friends. Um, and as a part of the collab, little ugly, weird cardboard cutouts were placed around. I just don't understand. Like, this is freaky. This is, if I was a bear, if I was this bear right here, I'd be f***ing enraged if I saw that. That's some industrial society and it's future type shit. Release me into nature. Release me. But in the penguin enclosure, a character named Hululu would be added as many enclosures had their own specific characters in them. The penguin enclosure was a bit different though. A zoo visitor took notice to a certain penguin that took great interest in a cardboard cutout. That certain penguin, Grape Coon. Look at this little dweeb. Grape Coon would stare at this cardboard cutout for hours every single day. And then the zoo started to notice and they began tweeting, giving everyone a background and story of Grape Coon. A 20 year old penguin, a grandpa in penguin years, now me, someone who doesn't like to humanize animals that much, I would potentially just say, well, that penguin clearly is just uh, interested in the cutout. He's, it's really more of a, uh, a stimulus thing. It's like his version of watching TV. Imagine you're a sim and you right click and you hit admire on a, on a, a sculpture. That is what the penguin is doing, but He's not in love. I mean, you can't predict an animal's thoughts, right? You don't know. But guys, guess what? Grape Coon would do the unexpected and he would perform his sacred mating ritual on the cardboard cutout, trying to propose a holy matrimony with it. That's right. Dude thought that was real. Look at this. Am I big, am I badass enough for you, baby? Ha! Ha! So then the family tree was established. And we can see what happened. Beer's ugly, that little guy, he's an ugly little guy. And obviously as a result of this, knowing the internet, uh, Grape Coon became a legend for adopting a waifu as a, a wife for, or what is it? Oh, uh, but yeah, right, yeah. Anyways, Grape Coon began to amass an army of fans. Even the team behind the show would eventually visit him and the, the voice actor for the cardboard cutout that he was in love with, even visited little Mr. Great Blow. Here she is with him. Wow, that's very cute. And he's a bird and stuff. That's really funny. Grape Coon would spend his days staring at his fucking waifu for hours and hours on end every day, dystopian. This is crazy because this is what it's real life is like, guys. This is what, this is society moment, I think. So things were going very well for Grape Coon, but eventually the promotion between kimono friends and the zoos around Japan would end. And that meant all the cardboard cutouts needed to be removed. And the zoo decided, rightfully so, that it would be a terrible idea to remove the cardboard cutout from Grape Coon's enclosure because of his roller coaster of hell life that he's had. And luckily it was only removed once and that was to be protected from a storm. And you can see this, his wife was being taken away little guy but she was added back so he got cheered up he didn't move on he doesn't move on like that 
Coach Midori. Then later that year, still 2017, on October 9th, the zoo would announce a special event for Grape Coon. But then the next day, after the announcement of Grape Coon's event, it was announced, again, that he was not feeling well. Grape Coon had been removed from his enclosure along with his beautiful waifu. The event canceled, and the community hoping for the best. And then finally, Grape Coon passed away with his waifu by his side. Community was absolutely crushed, as you could probably imagine. No one has ever cared more about a penguin ever in history than in this moment in which all these people gathered around Grape Coon and his beautiful, sad incel story. They even set up a f***ing shrine for people to pay respects at the zoo. And they even left the cutout in the penguin enclosure, but changed the art to this. Adorable dude. Look at him. There's little Grape Coon there hanging out with Honda Malulumu or whatever her name was. So Grape Coon may have had a hard life, but he is forever immortalized as the husband, officially on the wiki, uh, for Hululu for this f***ing show or whatever the hell it is. She's a penguin woman. Grape the Penguin is her official canon husband. So weebs can't call her their waifu anymore. And that's f***ing awesome. I love a good incel success story. The internet is definitely a marvel, but also it's a big, stinking, deep, scary, uh, turd berg with turd boy in it and grape coon, etc. It's a tool for any kind of moral or immoral intentions. It can be used and abused. Anyways, thank you for watching.